For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want to give you this bizarre hypothetical scenario. This player right here is UAB running back Dwayne McBride, and he was the 222nd pick in the NFL Draft in 2023. McBride was a great player with the Blazers, running for 1,713 yards and 19 touchdowns in his junior season, being named the Conference USA Player of the Year in 2022, and after scoring 32 touchdowns across his final two seasons, was a huge reason why UAB was one of the best teams in Conference USA during that time frame. Now, I want you to imagine that after he got drafted by the Minnesota Vikings in the draft with pick number 222, he saw everyone else signing around him and said, Nah, I'm gonna hold out. I want more money. I know the market is completely 100% set, and I know what I'm gonna make, but the Vikings aren't offering me enough. I'm not signing unless they pay me what I think I deserve, and if they don't pay me, whatever. I'll just try again at the 2024 NFL Draft, despite not playing football for a year. You'd look at McBride like he was a moron, and the Vikings would be absolutely perplexed, but they wouldn't bite. The man's a 7th round pick. He has no leverage. The entire market around him is set. If he wants to hold out for some reason, I don't know why, but we're not going to lose too much sleep over it, since he might not have even made the roster anyways. And look, back in the day, before the rookie wage scale existed, holdouts were absolutely a thing for long periods of time. If you had your first round pick signed before training camp, it was shocking. However, of the guys that will hold out deep into camp, they're first round picks. Of the guys that make those threats, they're top of the line players. They're guys that have leverage. They're guys that feel as though they are being underpaid because the difference in each individual draft slot is magnified. They're guys that will get drafted the following year if they just re-enter. Maybe they won't go as high, and in fact, they definitely won't go as high, but they'll have some future in professional football. They're guys that the front office has a lot of pressure to sign, because if you just wasted a first-round pick and wasted that high draft capital on a guy that won't even play for you, your job is on the line, and heads are going to roll. They're not, you know, this man right here. They're not freaking ninth-round picks and the 222nd pick in the draft where their chances of making the roster are already slim to none, and where you're just throwing darts at the board and hoping something sticks. Because for some reason, at the 1986 NFL Draft, this man that you've been watching this whole time, Oregon State wide receiver Reggie Bynum, decided that it would be a good idea, after getting drafted, to hold out and demand more money, despite the fact that everyone around him had signed and despite the fact that he was, again, a ninth round pick. I think you're going to be shocked to find out as the story progresses that this did not work out whatsoever. Not in the slightest bit. Because this is the story behind what might just be, considering the circumstances, the dumbest draft holdout of all time. Before I talk about the decision to hold out and just how stupid it was, we need some context to understand how good this man right here was and what the situation was involving the team that drafted him. The year is 1986, and the Bills were looking for ways to improve their absolutely anemic passing game. Yes, things would improve by default with the collapse of the USFL, as they'd be getting Jim Kelly, their first round pick from 1983, finally under center, so they didn't have to trot out what felt like the corpse of Vince Ferragamo every Sunday. But the Bills had the worst passing offense in football in 1985, by a ton of metrics. There is a reason they finished that season 2-14 and, and tied with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for the worst record in the NFL, as not only were they dead last in points scored, but they were dead last in passing touchdowns, and were dead last in interceptions, throwing more picks than any team in football. The Bills had some promising young players that they drafted that year at the receiver position in Jackson State wideout Chris Burkett in Round 2, and future Hall of Fame wide receiver Andre Reid in Round 4 who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But they needed some more depth. They needed as many quality bodies as possible to try and right this ship. And with that in mind, 
They drafted the man that you've been watching this whole time as in the ninth round with pick number 222, the Buffalo Bills and general manager Bill Bullion decided to draft Oregon State wide receiver Reggie Bynum. It was a bit of a surprise that he went that low. Some mock drafts had him anywhere from rounds 3 through 5. And yes, there were reasons why he went low. His bowl security left a lot to be desired. He wasn't the best at making contested catches, and he had some serious injury issues, but make no mistake about it. When he was at Oregon State, Bynum could absolutely play. By the time his career with the Beavers ended, he was the school's all-time leading receiver, posting 149 catches for 2,231 yards and 15 touchdowns. As a sophomore in 1983, his 24.2 yards per catch not only led the entire Pac-10 amongst all qualified players, but led the entire NCAA. He also led the Pac-10 with seven receiving touchdowns, becoming the first player in Oregon State history to ever lead the conference in that category. In 1984, he led the Pac-10 in receptions with 51, becoming just the second player in school history at the time to lead the conference in that category, alongside Steve Curry in 1979. And in 1985, he saved maybe his best season for last, when he had 61 receptions for 703 yards and 7 touchdowns, ranking inside the top 3 of the Pac-10 in each of those major categories. Put the ball in his hands, and Bynum could make some plays. The Bills realized this, and thought that this was a good use of their ninth round pick. One writer for the Buffalo News even said that this was the biggest steal of the draft. So you figure that the Bills would be able to sign the man, right? You figure that with Bynum being a ninth round pick, that signing him would be relatively easy, like it is with just about everyone at that spot, since there's only so much bargaining you can do once you get that deep in the draft. And you'd especially think that because Bynum had no interest in the Canadian Football League, and the United States Football League was no longer a thing after its antitrust lawsuit against the NFL. Which they technically won, but really didn't, seeing as they won $3 in damages, or $1 plus treble, because antitrust suits are always trebled. It'd be very different if Bynum was negotiating with other teams in other leagues. That has happened many times before, and that's a complete non-story. But it was Buffalo or bust. It was the NFL or bust. Getting Bynum under contract shouldn't be any problem at all, and should be as easy as switching to Geico. But for some reason, Reggie Bynum decided that he wanted a lot of money. He wanted a crap ton of money, even though he wanted to play in the NFL, had no leverage, and had no viable plan B. Because Bynum decided that it was a good idea to hold out. It seemed like the two sides were coming to a completely hassle-free agreement. On Thursday, July 24th, it seemed like the two sides would come to terms right as camp was starting, in a pretty reasonable timeline. However, talks broke off out of nowhere, and didn't even pick up over the weekend. It was now late July and Bynum was still unsigned, and now we were in August, and Buffalo's ninth round pick, with no other options, was still holding out for some reason, thinking that he had any leverage, or thinking that this plan to get more money would work. And one week later, Bynum gave the Bills an ultimatum, Sign me, or I'm going back to Corvallis and re-entering the draft in 1987. A ninth round pick saying, you better sign me right now and give me what I want, or I'm not playing for you guys, and I'll just try again in 1987 by re-entering the draft and get my value up. That is a, well, that's a bold strategy, Connor. Let's see if it pays off for him. Like, your value is going to go up after sitting out a year, when you obviously have no college eligibility left, and when you got drafted in the ninth round. Spoiler alert, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. A 2023 model of a car doesn't go up in value in the year 2024. You were drafted in the ninth round for a reason, and you think you have leverage on the bills, and that you can go back to school and increase your stock, even though you can't play for a year, even though no general manager will want to draft you, because you're a pain in the butt to sign and not worth it at all, and even though no scout is looking at you, because they already did last year, and came to the conclusion that you're not anything more than a ninth rounder. And they're supposed to change their minds with no new film, and with worse data than before, 
Knowing that you're rusty? Yeah, this is really dumb. The Bills not reaching an agreement by mid-August with running back Ronnie Harmon and offensive tackle Will Wolford is one thing. Those are two first-round picks, and there was always some haggling involved in those days before the rookie Wade scale. The Bills not reaching an agreement with their ninth-round pick? Delusional. Absolutely delusional. And if you thought this was pretty dumb already, don't worry. It gets dumber when we put it in the appropriate historical context. The previous year at the 1985 NFL Draft, there were a grand total of 28 players to get drafted in the ninth round, including maybe the greatest gunner of all time in Steve Tasker, who absolutely should be in the Hall of Fame, but that's beside the point. Of those 28 players, you want to know how many of them actually played in the NFL? 13 of them. That's it. Less than half the players to get drafted in 1985 in the ninth round even so much as played a snap in this league. And it's really 12, because one of them was running back Jamie Covington, who only played in the NFL for two games in 1987 as a replacement player. So you really think you have any leverage here? You really think this decision to hold out makes any logical sense? You think the decision to sit out the 1986 season is smart? And it gets even worse! In 1985, Buffalo spent a ninth round pick on Norfolk State defensive back Len Jones. He never played it down in the NFL, so he was one of the 15 or 16 players, I guess, if you don't count players to exclusively play in the replacement games, to never play it down in the NFL. In 1984, the Bills spent their ninth round pick on Appalachian State defensive end Leroy Howell. He never played it down in the NFL. In 1983, the Bills spent a ninth round pick on Norfolk State running back George Parker. If I had a nickel for every time in the 1980s the Bills spent their ninth round pick on a Norfolk State player of all people, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's rare that it's happened twice. He never played it down in the NFL. In 1982, the Bills spent a ninth round pick on USC defensive end Dennis Edwards. At the time of camp in 1986, he never played it down in the NFL, although he would play three games with the Los Angeles Rams in 1987 during the strike. The last time the Bills actually had a ninth round pick make the roster was in 1981, with Millersville running back Rob Riddick, who actually gave the Bills tremendous value for a ninth round pick, and might have been Buffalo's best pick in that draft class. But still, for each of the last four years, the Bills' ninth round pick didn't make the team. Most ninth round picks don't make the team. At the time, excluding Riddick, the last ninth round pick the Bills drafted that actually played a game in the NFL was Arkansas wide receiver Mike Repond in 1973, who played two games with the Bengals. And the last ninth round pick the Bills drafted that played a game with the Bills was Tulsa running back Gary McDermott, who was drafted in 1968, before the stadium in Orchard Park was a thing. That was so long ago that the merger had not been finalized yet. The only postseason for Major League Baseball was the World Series, as there were no championship series yet. And man had not landed on the moon. If you were born in spring of 1968, and were about to go off to college in 1986, in your lifetime, you saw one ninth round pick actually make a Buffalo roster. That's it. And you thought you could hold out for more money? You seriously thought that you get the bills to open up their checkbooks and pay you more than what you're worth? even though the rest of the market with other ninth round picks had been set around you? How dumb are you? How dumb is your agent? Why did you possibly think this was good advice? Your holdout and demands mean nothing to them. It's almost like a boycott. Let's say a company does something highly controversial. Let's say, for instance, the NFL announces that at halftime of every game, they're going to take one random fan from the stands and perform a live human sacrifice and televise it. Visa has been the official partner of the NFL since 1995, and they pay some pretty big bucks to do it. If the NFL announces this, and Visa comes in and says, you know what, we're not going to be giving you any more money. We're dropping out of the advertising game with you guys unless you change this rule. There may be some pressure. But if the faceless profile on Twitter who created an account three days ago, and has two followers both of whom are bots encouraging you to check out their bios so you can see their special parts, 
declares that he's never going to give another dollar to the NFL again unless they change this rule, you know what this means? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And Reggie Bynum to the Buffalo Bills, considering the fact that he was a ninth round pick, was way more akin to the faceless Twitter user. He was not even a grain in the sand on the largest beach in the world. He was irrelevant. So it's going to come as a surprise to absolutely no one that no, the Buffalo Bills did not end up signing this man. Bynum made his demands and the Bills were like, uh, okay? And just opted to let him hold out and not play the 1986 season. Bynum went back to school where he obviously had no eligibility left to improve his draft stock. And the Bills just went on with their business as though nothing had happened. Shocker, Bynum regretted the decision. Because as it turned out, sitting out the 1986 season to try and get more money out of Buffalo, despite having no leverage whatsoever, was not the best move in hindsight. Bill's general manager Bill Polian said on this, I don't think he thought through his decision to sit out this year. Understatement of the century right there. Bynum ended up changing agents and signed a contract with the Bills in January of 1987. They had until the 1987 NFL draft start date to come to terms on an agreement before he would automatically re-enter the draft. And Bynum quickly signed after the regular season ended, realizing that this did not work out in the slightest bit. Bynum was finally a bill, but a year later than anyone thought, and out however much money he would have made initially. And yes, even though Bynum was now on the bills in 1987, the damage was done, as he would never play a regular season game for the team, or for any team in the NFL. Actually, I shouldn't say that. He did play one game in 1987, but there is a giant asterisk next to that, because that was a Week 6 game against the New York Giants, as in, a replacement player game, where teams were just looking for anyone who had a pulse and had some understanding of the playbook to fill in. Unless you count the one game that he was a scab, where he had two catches for 24 yards and a 6-3 victory, Bynum never played in the NFL. And keep in mind that Bynum wasn't even good enough or valuable enough to be on the Bills roster at the start of the strike, as he only rejoined the team on October 14th, 1987, two weeks after replacement games had already been going on. So yeah, this holdout really worked in his favor. Genius. Absolutely genius. Now, this was the 1986 NFL draft that we're talking about. And there was another player that held out at the 1986 draft that ended up not signing with the team that drafted him. And that was Tampa Bay Buccaneers running back Bo Jackson, as in the first overall pick in the draft that year. However, the difference between Bo Jackson and Reggie Bynum, as in the man who got drafted by this team behind me right here, is like night and day. Bo Jackson had a very valid reason for holding out. The Buccaneers completely screwed him over by screwing over his college eligibility for playing baseball. On top of that, Jackson had a viable plan B. His NFL career was also never in jeopardy. Other teams were going to draft him if he just entered the draft in 1987 again because he was that good and was projected as a phenomenal player. Reggie Bynum? Yeah, the, the reason for his holdout was, uh, your guess is as good as mine, honestly. So what do we learn from all of this? If you're the 222nd pick in the NFL draft and you're a ninth rounder, you have no leverage. So don't try creating leverage that does not exist. If you are trying to get more money out of someone when the market has been set, it's probably not going to work out. Knowing your worth is absolutely critical, especially in relation to those around you. And if you don't know your worth, you can look absolutely ridiculous at the negotiating table. If most people in your position and in your field don't even make the roster as it is and get the job as it is, and you're out there asking for outlandish demands that make no sense by any stretch of the imagination, you're probably not going to get what you want. And if you are doing contract negotiations at any stage in your life, whether you are an NFL player about to sign with a team, or just an average person in general, think of what Reggie Bynum and his agent did. And then, do the exact opposite. Because when all these elements are in play, you can't exactly be surprised when this play backfires. Talk about a dumb decision. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to JJ9Shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. 
Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.